All right, so let's now talk to let's now talk about some specialized applications of the SEM. And I bring up the first one because we just talked about why we need a um, high level of vacuum in the SEM chamber. So this creates problems. If we want to look at biological samples, uh, these are materials uh, where if you put them in a vacuum, you're really taking them out of their natural environment. Um, also, these biological samples uh, tend to have water, which is not something that, that you can have in a vacuum because it will create gas. Um, and so there's challenges to biological samples. Uh, but we can examine them with two, uh, two different kind of uh, approaches. Um, one of them is to freeze dry them. So basically go through this freeze drying process that, that you might have seen for you know, astronaut food uh, to remove the water, but maintain the kind of structure of the biological sample. And the other is a, a specialized version of the SEM that we call environmental SEM or eSEM, where we can um, examine samples in a higher uh, amount of gas. So we can basically add in water to certain regions of the microscope so that we can view uh, materials in more of their native state with water or with um, some type of gas pressure. So um, let's talk a little bit more about these two approaches. So the freeze drying, uh, we also um, refer to this as a critical point uh, drying. And so this is a process where we replace uh, water in the sample with liquid CO2. Um, then uh, the CO2 is vaporized um, and what it does is it allows us to remove water but if you just kind of you know try to evaporate water off on its own or you boil it or something like that you change the cell structure of biological samples so doing this process where uh, liquid CO2 is used to replace uh, leaves these cells intact so basically what we do is kind of a uh, very basic level is we dehydrate by replacing water with ethanol. So it might be a series uh, of steps that happens there. Then we place the sample in a vessel with liquid CO2. So pressure has to be manipulated to have liquid CO2. Um, and then this um, displaces ethanol and we can get liquid CO2 because again, we're dealing with the, the critical point here of CO2. And after that, it's heated and pressurized above the critical point so that we get basically a slow release of CO2 vapor, uh, maintaining the structure while still getting rid of CO2. So it's a kind of a labor intensive process, but it's well established for uh, samples that have water, so biological and other samples. So this is one approach. This is done quite frequently uh, in our EM center. Uh, we have uh, capabilities to do this fairly automatically. Um, it just takes um, specialized equipment. So let's now look at the other approach. And this is to not try to remove the water in the sample, but to try to basically um, image samples, such as biologicals, um, in uh, their native state, but do it in a way that requires lower vacuum levels. And so, again, this is the environmental SEM or ESM, and it's really good for biological samples. So the mechanism here is, again, taking advantage of what we just talked about with vacuum systems uh, and vacuum requirements. So the gun, again, is um, highly um, susceptible to oxidation and so the area around the gun and a majority of the chamber needs to be under ultra high vacuum so that nothing oxidizes and also the the beam is not uh, degraded with gas particles but what we do is we basically expose um, an area right around the uh, specimen to a low vacuum so we basically have separation between the sample region where we can flow a gas, and then we have sort of a buffer chamber. Uh, and 
these are all separated by what's called PLAs or pressure limiting apertures. And so that, oops, sorry, that allows us to separate this chamber, which has a low vacuum near the specimen uh, from this one that has a higher vacuum and then a, a much higher vacuum. So we get the advantage of kind of both. So we definitely need to have a majority of the beam uh, with no um, gas particles to make sure that the gun is protected and the beam is not degraded. But right around the specimen, uh, we have a l much lower vacuum so that we can maintain kind of the atmospheric conditions right near the specimen. So it's basically an environmental, or an environmental SEM is basically an SEM that has separate chambers to allow us to use a lower vacuum level right near the specimen. So this is one. This is the other approach we can take uh, for samples. All right. So I wanted to mention one last thing, um, talking about SEM. Uh, because this is, um, in my opinion, something that kind of bridges the gaps between SEM, which we're talking about now in uh, this chapter, and then what we're going to talk about next, which is transmission electron micro uh, microscopy, TEM, uh, because this is a method for sample preparation when we talk about SEM. So basically, uh, focused ion beam, this FIB process, um, is actually used in TEM to prepare our specimens. But also, the FIB system uh, functions much like an SEM. It has an imaging component as well as a uh, sample prep component where we can actually manipulate and uh, change the shape of samples. So it kind of bridges the gap between the two techniques that we're talking about. So just as a kind of um, basic introduction, uh, a FIB focused ion beam is, uh, as it sounds, we have an ion beam. This is usually um, gallium ions. And these, this ion beam is produced in order to mill or remove the specimen. So basically to change the shape. And so this is very similar to sputtering, which we just talked about. It's trying to remove sample uh, in order to cut or manipulate the size. So that's why we can use it to, if we have a sample, a large sample, we can cut it down to size in order to make a very thin uh, TEM sample. So that's what we can do with this FIB technique. And so we'll talk more about this uh, when we get into TEM and the different ways that we can uh, prepare samples for TEM.